Stand by for crime. Hi, Chuck Morgan. You know, right now, just about every large American city has a threat of communism. It's an insidious thing, dangerous, and a little bit frightening. In some cities, it's worse than others. Here in Los Angeles, where I work as a newscaster and radio station KOP, we feel that the threat is more than frightening. It's a menace that must be stamped out if our way of life is to survive. Most any day, you can turn the dial of your radio or pick up a newspaper and read where the Committee on Un-American Activities is investigating some well-known Hollywood celebrity. It gives you a queer feeling when you see those familiar names. You wonder who's going to be next and why. And you find yourself groping for an answer to this disease that is doing its best to undermine Americanism. Those were the thoughts that were running through my mind when I came into my office a few weeks ago and found the script for my 7 o'clock broadcast lying on my desk. I read it through and got a jolt that set me back on my heels. Just as I finished, my blonde secretary, Carol Curtis, came in. Hi, Chucky boy. Hi. Who wrote this? Who wrote what? This script, my 7 o'clock broadcast. Oh. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Uh, Pappy wrote it. He asked me to leave it on your desk. Pappy? Well, sure. What's wrong with that? After all, Chuck, Pappy owns KOP, and if he wants... Where are you going? Never mind. Now, you get at that typewriter and knock out another script. This one's out. See you later. Okay, Mayor, it'll be on the air tonight. Goodbye. Oh, hello, Chuck. What's on your mind? You know what's on my mind, Pappy. What kind of tripe is this you want me to broadcast tonight? Tripe? Hey, wait a minute. I wrote that script. So Carol said. Are you out of your mind, Pappy? It's loaded with red propaganda. I know it is. You know... Now, hold it, Pappy. This I don't believe. Sit down, Chuck, and I'll tell you about it. You better make it good. Chuck, if you use this script on your broadcast tonight, there'll be a storm of protest that'll start your ears ringing. Don't worry. I'm not going to as use it. As a matter it. of fact, if listener reaction becomes too great, I may have to go so far as to give you the can. I've already told you I... I'd... hate to have to do it, Chuck, but after all, I've got the station and its policies to think of. You'd probably have a tough time getting another job. Yeah, yeah, I probably would. Now, suppose we cut out the double talk and you give me the pitch? Suppose that did happen, Chuck. Suppose I did have to fire you. And I would if you used that script. What do you think would happen? Let's not try to find out. I'll tell you what I think would happen. You're a pretty important guy. Your opinion carries a lot of weight. The communists know that. So? So sooner or later, you'd be approached. Maybe offered a job on some other station. They'd have a well-worked-out plan wherein you could be of service to the cause. I'm still hazy on this, Pappy, but if you think that I'm Wait till I finish, will you, please? Now, if that should happen, you'd be in a position to put your finger on Mr. Big. Mr. Big? The FBI knows there's a big man here in L.A., a very big man. Maybe a high government official who's head of the communists. They want to know who he is. And they think I can locate him? It's a chance. That I'm not going to take. What do you take me for, Pappy? It might be weeks or even years before I could pull that chestnut out of the fire. I might never do it. In all that time, I wouldn't have a friend in the world. I'd be despised by everyone. But if you succeeded in doing the job, you'd uh, have performed a service for your country that may be measured in human lives and freedom and a way of life we want to keep in operation. It's a thankless job. It might be, except to those who are close to you, like myself and Carol Curtis. After it's over, she'd know. After it's over? Do you mean that even Carol wouldn't No be one's a... going to know about this, Chuck, but myself and the FBI. It's got to look like the real McCoy. You sound as if you expect me to do it. I do. Oh, you do? Well, get this through, it's you It's a nugget. pretty good country, Chuck. Let's do what little we can to keep it that way. You've exposed plenty of other rackets. Why not this one? Is it because you don't like the idea of being inconvenienced a little? Now, wait a minute. I never said anything... You've had everything your own way before with the police department behind you and the station behind you and every honest citizen in town behind you. Now that you've got a toughie coming up, what are you going to do? Chicken out? Why, you old goat, I... <laughs> uh, you... Don't let anyone tell you you're not a salesman because you're not. I just happen to like you, that's all. Which means you'll do it. Which means I'll do it, Pappy. But only under the condition that if I'm stoned out of town, you'll give me my job back when I bring you Mr. Big's ears. I 
made the broadcast, and the storm of protest began to come in almost at once. Studio phones were ringing before my 15 minutes were up. Carol Curtis was waiting for me when I got back to my office. This, I knew, was going to be the worst ordeal of all. I was glad it was first and would be over quickly. Yes, that's right, Mary. Hold the calls until I let you know. All right, Glamour Fisk. What are you holding the calls for? I want to talk to you. Okay, go ahead and talk. I heard the broadcast. Naturally, it's one of the jobs you paid for. What's behind it, Chuck? Behind what? You know what I'm talking about. You know what those telephone calls were about. You didn't mean any of those things you mentioned while you were on the air, did you? Of course I meant them. But, Chuck, it, it, it was red stuff. It was un-American. Don't be silly. It depends how you look at it. Well, at least half the city's looking at it the wrong way. Oh, golly, I'll be glad when it gets to be 11 o'clock. Then you can tell everybody you were kidding. I wasn't kidding. Now, look, you get paid to be my secretary, not my critic. Get over to that typewriter uh, and Stop get... it, Chuck. I want to know the truth. Did you mean those things you said? Yes, yes, I meant them. A man's got a right to his own opinion, hasn't he? Mm, not when it smells to high heaven of treason, he hasn't. Freedom of speech doesn't mean you can yell fire in a crowded theater. Fire in a crowded theater, what a comparison. Look, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Now get out of my hair and go back to work. No. What do you mean, no? I mean that unless you give me some explanation of that broadcast, I'm through. I'm not going to work for a red lover. Oh, you're not. We we get... Oh. Hello, Pappy. I've been outside listening to most of this conversation. I don't like it. Chuck, what's your answer? Answer to what? To Carol's request for an explanation of your broadcast. She doesn't get it. Neither do you. I say what I please and no one tells me any differently. Then will you two scram so I can go to work on my 11 o'clock show? Oh, so you think you're a pretty big man, do you? Say anything you please and no one tells you differently. Well, let me tell you something. There isn't going to be any 11 o'clock broadcast by Chuck Morgan. Not on KOP. You're fired. Well, it was a pretty good act. Carol was convinced, all right. I don't believe I'll ever forget the expression of disbelief and horror and hurt on her face when I walked out of that office. It gave me a queer feeling of hopelessness, as though I'd been convicted of a crime I hadn't committed and lost the respect and love of the one person who was most important in my life. Which, of course, is more or less true. But I didn't have much time to think about it right then. Even though only ten minutes had elapsed since I'd finished that broadcast, there was a small and angry crowd gathered at the entrance of the fenced-in parking lot. They were waiting for me. A studio cop was holding them back. Hurry in, red lover! This was worse than I expected. It wasn't going to be easy to take. I walked over to my car and got in. The crowd at the gate was getting bigger. Another cop had arrived. I decided if I were going to get out of there with my whole hide, I'd better be now. I started up and headed for the gate, moving fast in second gear. The cops opened a hole and I headed for it. Then I saw a woman break into the path of my headlights and I had to slow down. Someone pulled her back into the crowd, but I'd almost stopped. Then something came sailing through the air. If my car weren't equipped with unbreakable glass, I would have been knocked silly. It made me mad. I rammed on the brake, stopped within ten feet, and got out. All right, you bums, come and get it. That was a mistake. It taught me a lesson. They didn't come and get it. They came and got me. I was taken home in an ambulance and left nursing my wounds by a couple of unsympathetic interns. At 11 o'clock, I snapped on the radio. Pappy Mansdale came on what ordinarily would have been my last broadcast of the day with a special announcement. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is John Mansfield, president of KOP Broadcasting Company. I have an announcement to make that will interest you all. Charles Chuck Morgan was dismissed from his duties as a newscaster on this station early this evening. Most of you know why. For those of you who don't, I'll tell you why. Charles Morgan is a communist. He admitted it early this evening. And this station will have no part of... Pappy sounded convincing. Too convincing. I began wondering if when the time came he'd be able to convince people I was a loyal American citizen and loved being one. That hopeless, not-belonging feeling swept over me again. And it grew worse during the next few days. I hoped that Carol might phone me. But she didn't. I tried calling a few of my friends, just to feel them out, and 
and got a brush off in every case. But I didn't realize how seriously I was ostracized until I began looking for a job. That was the plan for me to look for a job and get one if I could. I naturally started in on the other radio stations. It's no use, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Adams told me if you showed up around here to have you thrown out. You got a nerve coming around here, Morgan? Get out! Are you nuts, Morgan? Think I want to lose every advertiser I have by hiring a red? Now, wait a minute. Won't he even talk to me? Well, that took care of the radio stations. Pappy should feel proud of the job he'd done on me. So next, I went to work on the newspapers. Only this time, I decided to save myself a lot of humiliation by using the phone. The secretaries of the first two publishers I called gave me a fast brush. I expected the same from the third. The Los Angeles Weekly News Ledger. But I didn't get it. This was a surprise. The Ledger, a conservative weekly news magazine, was owned by a man named Travers Bullard. Bullard, a powerfully built, lantern-jawed man, had the reputation for fine principles and square dealings. When the secretary told him I was on the wire, he sent back word he'd like to have me come over for a talk. This was the first sympathetic piece of dialogue I'd had in more than a week. It sounded so good, I turned into an eager beaver. I got down to the ledger office in less than an hour, cooled my heels in an outside waiting room for another hour, and then was ushered in to see Travers Bullard. Hello, Mr. Bullard. Hello, Morgan. So you're looking for a job, are you? I sure am. Not used to hanging around doing nothing. It's not good for men. No, that's right. Still feel the same way you did about things when you made that broadcast last week? Now, look, Mr. Bullard, if you're going to hold that against... Answer the question. All right. I'll answer it. Yes, I feel the same way. I thought you might. That's why I asked you to come down here. Oh? Yeah. I wanted to tell you face to face what a low-down, sneaking rat you are. I wanted to remind you that America is better off without dirty, stupid traitors like yourself. That I'm going to do everything in my power to see that you, and all like you are thrown out on your ear. You're like so many others, Morgan. You take advantage of all the fine things that America has to offer. You come to accept these things as your rightful heritage, and it never occurs to you that it's your responsibility to help keep that heritage intact. Instead, you turn to some stinking, small-minded philosophy that isn't worth the powder to blow it. That's why I asked you down here, Morgan, to tell you what I thought and to do this. Just for the record, I'd like to say that if you're an American citizen, enjoying the privileges that America has to offer, you're lucky. For the first time in my life, I was deprived of my heritage. And therefore, for the first time, I was knowing its real worth. Freedom of speech. Freedom from fear. A sense of belonging. Of knowing that I was a part of this great America. That what I said was important. That as an individual, I was needed and wanted. And not a sheep that instinctively and blindly followed a leader. Now I was deprived of these blessings. I was on the outside, looking in. I was the man without a country, hated, despised, rejected by the free society I loved. It was tough. I thought that if I ever got back my self-respect, I'd never again complain about anything that was American. One night, I was eating dinner in a joint down in Lower Vine Street. May I sit down? Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure, but you better wait a minute. I want you to know who I am first. You might change your mind. <laughs> I know who you are. You're Chuck Morgan. Yeah, that's right. Still want to sit down? Of course. You look so lonesome and forlorn sitting here by yourself. <laughs> well, I guess that about describes that I am lonesome and forlorn. Have a drink? No, no, thank you. This is unbelievable. You have no friends. No. I'm poison to everybody I used to know. <laughs> then perhaps you'd like to meet some new friends? Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, look, don't waste your time, miss. I tell Just you that... call me Maria. Okay, Maria. Don't waste your time. No one wants any part of me. I think perhaps you are wrong. Yeah? 
Well, then you don't read the papers. Oh, yes. I read the papers every day and listen to the radio, too. Especially the news broadcasts on KOP. Oh, I see. Then, if you are sure that you do see, perhaps you would like to join me and some of my friends at a small gathering we are having. When? This evening. I'm sure you'll find many sympathetic people among those present. Well, sounds like fun. Shall we go? We drove out to a small stucco house on a side street off Washington Boulevard in Culver City. There were half a dozen people inside. Nice, ordinary-looking people. They all shook hands with me warmly. Nobody said anything about the broadcast that got me fired. In fact, nothing much of anything happened. Around 11 o'clock, the meeting broke up and I drove Maria home. The next day, I met her for lunch. And two nights later, we attended another meeting. This time, it was at a house in Glendale. None of the same people were there. But this new bunch were just as friendly... One of them was a guy named George Zerda. And he gave me my first inkling of what the score was. Nice bunch of people, don't you think, Mr. Morgan? Come it, Chuck. Yeah, they're swell. How are things going with you? Lousy. Kind of tough getting a job when you don't happen to think along the lines of certain people, huh? <laughs> it's murder. Need any dough? Yeah, yeah, I could use a few bucks. Well, here's a hundred. And uh, don't worry about paying it back. Well... Uh, Thanks. Forget it. Ever think of leaving L.A.? Well, I may have to if I don't get a break pretty soon. Well, how about the East Coast? That's okay. There's a couple of radio stations there that could use a good newscaster with the uh, right ideas. Well, they hire me, though. Every station in the country knows about me being fired. It could be arranged. I see. How about Doe? You could practically name your own figure. If you obeyed orders. Who'd be giving the orders? The big man himself. When do I get to meet him? Maria will let you know. Well, this was it. Apparently, my indoctrination period was about over. Now I knew I'd been closely watched. I guess that my telephone lines had been tapped. And I congratulated myself on not having attempted to get in touch with Pappy or anyone else. I guess it was a genuine sense of loneliness that I'd felt that made my act pay off. Well, three nights later, Maria and I went to the Vine Street Derby for dinner. It's been a long time since I've eaten here. In the East, you will be able to go many places and hold your head up. Oh, you know about that. <laughs> I know about many things. I'm uh, waiting for the answer to one. Yes. You will be home tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock? Mm, could be arranged. Someone going to call? Perhaps. The big man? Let us speak of him as the leader. And by the way, you will be one of the few who know his identity. Well, that must mean that uh, the job he has for me must be pretty important. Extremely so. You must be plenty sure I'm the real thing. The leader does not make mistakes. You have been carefully checked. Good. I'll be glad to get started. Incidentally, do I know uh, the leader? You know, I, I don't want to get too much of a shock. You will be shocked. Then I do know him, eh? You know him very well. Ah, well, that's very interesting. Well, until tomorrow night, then, a toast to the leader and my new job. The next day was the longest I'd ever lived. It was hard to believe that the ordeal of the past few weeks was nearly over. That almost as soon as tomorrow I'd be able to sit in front of a microphone at KOP and tell the world that I was an American and glad of it. By 6.30, I was so nervous my hands were trembling. I went into the kitchen and poured myself a straight shot. I was still there when the door buzzer sounded. But here it was. I got up, feeling a sense of anticipation that was almost eerie. Then I forgot that, forgot everything, in fact, but the job at hand and crossed to the door. I knew the man who was standing there all right. Knew him very well indeed. It was Pappy Mansfield. Pappy! 
What the devil? Never mind that now. Where can I hide? Hide? Do you realize that... I realize everything. Get me out of sight in a hurry. Okay, come in. In there. Keep away from the windows. Good deal. See you later. Yeah. See you later. You bet he'd see me later, the old goat. Didn't he realize he almost loused up two weeks of work on my part? I didn't have much time to think about it. Less than two minutes later, the buzzer sounded again. This time, I felt it was going to be the McCoy. Have a check? Travers Bullard. Surprised, eh? Yeah, yeah, I thought that you... Uh, sorry about that crack on the jaw, my boy. But I had to make sure you were convinced I wasn't the leader. You convinced me, all right. And you convinced me and the other members of our little group that you weren't working a gag. You'll make a good member of the party, son. We're glad to have you with us. Thanks. Now, let's get down to business, shall we? You'll find all your instructions in this envelope. In two days, you'll leave for New York. One of our agents will meet you at the airport. Anything else in the envelope? Uh, one of the first things you'll have to learn, my boy, is not to ask questions. Just obey orders. But since you're new to the organization, I'll let you in on a few things. That envelope is loaded with information about the future plans of a couple of our biggest airplane plants. You mean that you... But how? The Los Angeles Weekly News Ledger is a big and powerful magazine, my boy. And a man as well trusted as I, well, there are ways. Now then... Travers Bullard. Well, this is a day I never expected to see. Mansfield. Morgan, did you... I mean, for two weeks we tried to trip you up. No, I don't believe it. Our organization is too perfect. We never make mistakes. You've made one Bullard a butte. All the evidence we need to put you where you belong is contained right here in this envelope. No, you'll never expose me. Never. I've worked too hard. There's too much at stake. Watch him, Chuck. He's got a gun. Yes, I see he has. That makes things even. The man behind him has one, too. You can't fool me with that one. It's too old and corny. Now stand over there, both of you. Suit yourself, Bullard. If you figure that dying's better than prison. Look out, Pappy! Oh. 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 It was quite a fight. Pappy had tripped over a rug, and Bullard, suspecting a trick, had swung on him, which was my cue to repay with interest that crack on the jaw he'd given me down at the ledger office. Bullard, however, was a powerful man, and it took a lot of doing to get him under control. His gun went off in the fracas, but it didn't hurt anybody. He's still alive. Those of you who listen to my broadcast know where he is now. He's got a private room in a big gray building with iron bars on the window. Pappy and I got back to the station around 10 o'clock. Here's your office, Pappy. Now tell me, what was the idea of almost lousing up my good work by showing up at the apartment five minutes before Bullard arrived? Because it occurred to me at the last minute that two witnesses to his dialogue would be more effective at a trial, especially with you having seemingly gone over to the Reds. Yeah, I see, you're right. Well, as it turned out, the information contained in the envelope would have been enough. That's right. Trouble is, I didn't know there were going to be an envelope. Well, anyhow, it's okay now. Oh, uh, she's waiting for you in your office. Good night. So long, Pappy. It's good to be back. See you. Hi, Glamour Puss. Hi, Chuck. Your script's ready for the 11 o'clock broadcast. Want to read it over? Oh, I don't know. What's in it? The facts about you exposing Travis Bullard. No kidding. How'd you know about that? Pappy phoned me. Did he now? Mm Mm-hmm. I see you're all in a sweat about having me back. I knew you'd be back. No kidding. How'd you know that? Well, I figured it out. You went ramming out of here that night Pappy wrote your script and yelling at me to write another. And then you came back and said you were going to use the one Pappy wrote. Oh, I'm not so dumb. No, as a matter of fact, you're nowhere near as dumb as... Don't you say it. Don't you dare. If you tell me once more I'm not as dumb as I look, I'll I'll bring you with this typewriter. (laughs) You know something, Glamourpuss? What? You're a ham. Why, You're you... You're putting on an act. What you really want to do is ball and fling your arms around my neck and tell me you're glad to have me back. I don't. Be... I don't at all. I... I... Oh, Chuck! <laughs> Glamourpuss. <laughs> 